Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of this great country, Canada. Over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Now, today, we are honored to be sitting down with Aurora, Ontario Councillor Rachel Gilliland. But before we get into today's interview, I wanted to ask you to do us a favor hit that subscribe button right now so you can stay up to date on all of our latest interviews and all of our latest other shows episodes municipal affairs with chris brown political trenches local government at work our mission is to educate to tell the municipal stories in this great country so please hit that subscribe button now on to the interview Councillor, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me today. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start with sort of the generic question that I've started all my interviews off with municipal leaders from across Canada. So you're no exception to it. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Rachel? Thank you for the question, Chris. I really do appreciate that. And thanks so much for having me on the, the podcast today and giving me this opportunity to speak to the community um, well, essentially, you know, I raised my family here in Aurora and uh, I did a lot of volunteer work. And uh, after my kids had gotten a little bit older, I went back to work and it was honestly, it was a, a very awakening moment because I was again, now, now I'm away from the community and I, I really felt um, divided and uh, as far as not being able to contribute the way I, I used to. So I actually took a hiatus from my full time job and decided to work part-time so I could focus on the community again. And through that, um, I had discovered some things on a larger, grander scale that I really wanted to give back. And one of the big um, components to that was really protecting what made Aurora a great place to live, which is that sense of community. And when I first moved to Aurora, which was way back in the late 90s, um, what I, my favorite thing was that, you know, you would be able to knock on the door and ask for that cup of sugar and finish your, 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 your cookies. Uh, you'd walk down the street. Someone's always like waving, saying, hello, how's your day? And, uh, those are really, uh, values that I want to protect. And, uh, what led me to run really was I had, I could, I'd start to see some, a lot of the change and growth happening in our town and, uh, I wanted to help protect some of that character and that charm that we so love so dearly. And so part of that led to me being on a ratepayers association and being coming more involved and that led to being more politically engaged. And that's when I decided to run for council to make a difference. And uh, and then I was successful. So I'm, I'm very grateful and humbled by that. Before we talk about your career as a counselor, I want to get to know the per, the persona behind the counselor, the public persona of a counselor. And I, I kind of want to start with growing up. Was politics discussed at the dinner table? <laughs> uh, I would say politics was discussed around the dinner table, probably more on federal and provincial issues, not necessarily, necessarily municipal issues. So I'm no stranger to those conversations. And, uh, you know, sometimes people didn't like talking about it because it could become controversial. And, uh, you know, myself included as, a, you know, a, a young girl growing up in the family. And, uh, you know, I just kind of, I guess, put it kind of shelved it over there. And as I became, you know, an adult with a family, I started realizing how important these things are, and especially on a municipal level as well, and how it affects you directly. So, I am grateful for having those conversations and being able to have open debates with the family and uh, and just try and understand like what's important to us moving forward. So when when did you start getting interested in municipal politics? Because you say you moved to Aurora in 1990. Was it like in 1990 or because you you put your name for it first, if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong, in 2018, you were successful in that election. Did politics sort of just come in the last 10 years, hypothetically, or was it just the buildup of saying, okay, I'm going to look for where I can put my voice, whether it be through that ratepayers association, but in 2018, I have to make a decision. There's a provincial election going on. You can give back to your community that way. There's a municipal election going on, and there's a potential federal election going on in 2019. So you decide municipal is where your voice would be best suited. What was the lead up to saying that's where Rachel's voice needs to be the municipal level? I appreciate the uh, the question. So just just for a point of clarity, I know I 
I prefaced the 90s. So it was in 96 that I purchased my first home just, just to make sure that I have my facts straight out there because I do put that on my literature. Um, you know, I think there was really a lead up to that because I wasn't just on one rate pairs association. I was on several and including the very first home that I had purchased in Aurora uh, back in 96. So I do believe it was a lead up to that. And obviously, you know, loving my community of Aurora, I really wanted to be able to give back. And, uh, you know, on the municipal level, that seemed like a really great starting point for me of where I can make a difference on the ground and see the effects of those results immediately. Was it always a, a easy answer to say, okay, this is the election that I'm getting involved in 2018. I see what's going on in my community. Or had you considered in the 2014 election, the four years prior, which municipalities in Ontario go to an election every four years, or was 2018 sort of the, sort of the, the, where the dam burst and you said, okay, now is the time. I didn't really look at 2014 to be quite honest. I think I was so caught up corporately in my work. Uh, like most people have their, you know, their head down and they're just uh, going about their daily lives. I would say prior to that, I was looking at uh, what was going on in the municipality as far as, you know, the policies that were being made and how we're being affected. But life gets busy with your kids come 2018. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was a really huge decision. And, um, you know, there's a lot to overcome. And it's scary at, at first when you're thinking, okay, hey, I'm really going to do this. But I did have encouragement from a lot of people in the community because I did see what I had been doing in the community and I did have a voice and I did attend council meetings and I did speak at the podium on certain issues and people could see that um, I had uh, a lot to contribute to the community as a councillor. So it felt like a natural first fit for me to get involved and, uh, you know, it, and, 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 it, and it worked. So I'm very, again, like I said, I'm very grateful and humbled to be able to get to where I am today. One of the reasons why I started this show was because I, I, I found, and I hate painting broad strokes with the paintbrush here, but I, I kind of do it often on this show, but I, I don't think the average resident's truly understands the jurisdictional roles that municipalities hold in our day-to-day -day lives. When you were at the doorstep in 2018, and even in the subsequent election of 2022, were people approaching you with municipal issues, or were they talking about provincial and federal issues? And again, I don't like painting broad strokes with this question, but I kind of feel like I need to, because I'm hearing from municipal councillors from across Canada that the municipal jurisdiction is so gray that people don't understand what the roles and responsibility that the municipality has compared to the provincial and federal. For the town of Aurora in 2018 and even 2022, were they aware that the uh, the municipality had certain issues that they could only look after and provincial issues were provincial jurisdictions? Thank you for the question, Chris. Uh, in 2018, I would suggest that there was a large majority of people that I had knocked on doors who actually did understand the, the basic fundamental services of municipalities when it comes to snow plowing, um, your garbage pickup, um, zoning, your official plan. The official plan, it was a very hot topic actually at that time. So uh, we do have a very politically engaged municipality and uh, I think it's very unique that way. Uh, although fast forward to 2022, I would say it's a little bit different story because of the pandemic that we had gone through. I did find myself actually a lot busier in a different way. And that's because we were handling a lot of inquiries that were um, more provincial and federal related, um, such as um, mental health and, uh, you know, extra funds and, and housing and uh, um, all sorts of other various things. And through that, you know, I had done a lot more collaborating with different levels of government and started to host some roundtable discussions and inviting MPs and MPPs with local stakeholders and residents on certain industries just to help give that support. And uh, I think it was really important that municipal councillors and mayors did get involved publicly so we could help assist residents on the ground because they felt like they were at a loss. And of course, we wanted to be able to help and say, here are these resources and let's work together to get you that information. You, you deal with a lot of issues on a day-to-day -day basis. And to quote the president of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, municipalities like the town of Aurora are the government of proximity. The decisions you make impact your community the next day. And 
sometimes the provincial government it can take longer to uh, see an impact or federally could take even longer to see an impact for you in your role as councillor in the almost i want to say five years since you were first elected in 2018 have you seen your impact your decisions that you make around that council table have a meaningful impact at the local level in your community do you think absolutely uh, I think that's what, you know, part of being a counselor's role is, is to make policy change. And, uh, you know, I, I really look forward to, you know, bringing motions and, and contemplating different policies and different adjustments in our budget to meet the community needs. So absolutely, I do feel that these decisions um, have a huge impact. And in fact, I think, you know, versus a uh, federal and provincial, um, I mean, I would, <laughs> I'd say things slow downstream. So that does affect us. Um, how long it takes to affect us is a different story. Um, although I could say that's something different with the inflation rates and stuff. That's a different conversation. But on a municipal level, uh, we're the ones that are on the ground with the residents and the community. And and first and foremost, you will feel those effects. And property taxes play, play a role. And you know how we spend that money in order to service the community is very important. And if we decide to make a policy change that's going to, you know, affect the community, that's immediate effect. So, yes, I, I would say so. So on the flip side of that, because it's always the double edged sword of you see the impact, but the decisions you make impact your residents the most. So when you walk into that council chamber, you have to be prepared to vote on something that could potentially impact residents the day after. And you talk about the inflationary issues that are going on, not just in the town of Aurora, but across Canada. Um, does it make your job harder to understanding that the decisions you make are affecting your neighbors, your family members, your uh, colleagues, and even people you don't know who are struggling day to day? Yes, thank you so much for the question. Um, absolutely, I would say that it does wear on me because I have to put myself in two different shoes. In my opinion, you don't go in with the mindset of what you want as a as a person or as a citizen. Uh, you need to make sure you're wearing both shoes and objectively look at both sides. Um, you know, how do you do that? Sorry, how do you how do you how do you, how do you objectively look at both sides? Because in 2023, we see our we find ourselves, and I I I'm, I'm cautious to say this out loud but we are in echo chambers in our society right now we we listen to people who are we are friends with who are on our facebook pages our twitters or x's or whatever you want to call it do you actually go out and actually try to find people on the opposing side of issues to see where they're coming from or how do you objectively look at both sides when you're coming up with uh, uh sort of a, the way you're going to decide you're going to vote at a council a meeting yeah, so we do, like I was saying, we have a very engaged community politically, and often you'll see uh, letters to the editor on certain issues. Um, we will get emails in our inbox, and uh, you know I I will reach out to these residents to to help understand. You know, also other council colleagues. You know, you know you may already know they have a different opinion or a stance on something, and you have a conversation with that colleague to say like why why do you think that. Uh, I also do rely on staff as well. So I will ask a lot of questions to staff. I'll go outside the box. Um, if, for instance, I want to have something that's, say, unbiased, I actually might reach out to another municipality and ask them questions and um, get some feedback from them. And it could be something on a similar topic. And I think that allows me to have an outside view looking in and being a little bit more objective on an issue. And I've done it before. I've done it when we decided, uh, you know, it was a very hot topic about, you know, whether or not we wanted to have a ward system. And I had realized that one of the few municipalities up north did, had a ward, didn't have a ward, back to a ward, and it was coming back to general council. And I reached out to all the councillors and the mayor, and I ended up talking to four councillors and the mayor about this issue. So I, I do find uh, you, you as a councillor, in my opinion, need to choose to do that extra work in order to make a sound decision. You bring up something I wasn't going to talk about, but you opened up Pandora's box, so I want to play in it for a second. Aurora is now uh, at a ward system level for its councillors. Prior to, I think in 2018, you were not. In 2022, you were. Um, it's kind of a weird area that I'm going to ask, but I'm going to try to ask it in an appropriate way. Um, when you move to an award system, you're elected by people in that certain ward. 
but you have to make decisions best on what's going on in the community. You can't look at it as a Ward 1 versus Ward 2 or Ward 3 versus Ward 4. You have to look at it as a Town of Aurora issue. How do you see yourself playing that role in balancing what your ward wants, the people who've elected you, with the understanding that you are a Town of Aurora councillor, not a Town of Aurora Ward 2 councillor? Yes, thanks so much for the question. Uh, I think I, I have the luxury, I think, of having been an at-large counselor and now a ward counselor. And so uh, I feel that that's a huge advantage. So whenever I am speaking with any of the residents that are either in my ward or outside my ward, um, often I'll pull that out and saying, well, you know, um, they'll say, oh, we're, I'm in ward two, by the way. So I'll be talking to a ward three resident. It's like, oh, well, you're not my counselor. And I'm like, well, that doesn't matter. I still make decisions based on the betterment of the entire community. And so, yeah, you do have to have a balance. And I look at things as a whole town wide issue. I think some of the benefits of being a ward counselor is that you now have your attention gravitated towards your section and you could really dial in on maybe some of the deficiencies that they have and whether it's, you know, around services or you know, recreation or, um, or too much of something, which I don't know if anybody has too much of anything. Uh, but uh, I do think there's some benefit to that, but yeah, definitely. I think when people are electing a counselor, for their ward that they want to have somebody that has the full rounded independent thinking for the greater good of the entire town. We are seeing some provinces head to municipal elections here over the next year. We have listeners across this great country and I want to get your advice for a second. What advice would you give a potential new candidate or someone who's thinking about running for municipal politics and would that be the same advice that you would have given yourself in 2018, knowing what you know now, five years later, being a municipal councillor? Yes, I think I would give myself the exact same advice. Uh, I knocked on as many doors as I possibly could. could. Make sure you own more than one pair of running shoes. Uh, when you think you're done knocking, no, nope, go out and knock some more. Be authentic. Be your authentic self at the door. You want to be quick and sweet. You want to make sure you can get through as many people as possible. But really, it's about you listening to the community and making sure that, you know, the intention of why you're running is for because that's what the community needs. And you have those qualities to help solve those issues. And if you're committed to doing that, then people are going to see that character, sincerity and that hard work. And that ultimately is what's going to help you get elected. So be you, be authentic, work hard, and it'll happen. How do you be yourself at, as a politician at the municipal level? Because I hear from people I speak to, and these are not politicians. These are people who look at politicians and say, oh, it's just another politician. It's just someone going to make me a promise. And then four years later, they're going to I'm going to see them again and they're not going to do the work in between. They're going to sit at council tables or the House of Commons or the Legislative Assembly and do what they do and forget about the people who elect them. How do you see yourself in the role of councillor in making sure don't people don't feel like they're just being brushed off during elections and you're being your authentic self and actually engaging with people during those election periods? Well, I really um, pride myself on ensuring the things that I say are honest. And so if I'm unsure if that's something that I can deliver, I'm not going to say I'm going to deliver something. But what I would say is that I would look at opportunities to help those efficiencies or to make that um, service become more available or whatever that issue is. And generally, I think through a conversation, you can, you can sense and feel that sincerity of that hard work that person's going to do. So it's using the choice kind of words, knowing when to stay in your lane and knowing what you're capable of. But if you're choosing to say something just because you want to get a vote, people are going to pick up on that. And ultimately what's going to happen is that you won't get reelected because people will see. So if you have happens to work for you one time, doesn't mean it's going to happen for you again. And uh, at the end of the day, the way I look at it is I know that I can sleep at night with the decisions that I make and the things that I say. I'm not perfect. I'm human, just like everybody else. And I try the best that I can do with the tools that I have. And it's my job and my role to make sure that I'm connecting with the community, following up, making sure we're doing a good job. And then if we need to make some changes, we continue doing so. That seems like a lot. And I I, I, I say that by asking this question to follow up is... 
the the role of the uh, local counselor is not a full time job, but it is a full time experience because you are a counselor twenty four seven seven days a week, three hundred sixty five days a year. You don't go off to Ottawa to do your job. You don't go to Toronto to do your job. You're in your community. So when you go to the grocery store, you're counselor. When you go out to the restaurant, you're counselor. And I can imagine that probably is daunting for yourself, but not only that, but for your family. Have you found the balance of being Rachel in the community and just being, or being counselor in the community and just being Rachel from time to time? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you gotta make sure that you, you gotta make sure your hair is brushed nicely all the time, right? <laughs> Sometimes you just want to wear that, you know, those, those pajama top things and, and just go. Uh, yeah, it is definitely a delicate balance. I'm not going to lie. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, you know, when you get into this role, it's a public role and uh, you are there to represent the community 24 seven. So I think by um, deciding on whether or not this is something for you, um, you need to understand that that's part of the that's part of the package. And uh, if you enjoy talking to people as much as I do, then it's a natural fit. Uh, I've always been somebody where I could go somewhere on my own, even growing up as a, a teen, uh, you could place me in any place and I could make new friends and talk to anybody. And I think that is probably one of my greater strengths. And I know my daughter who's in her twenties, uh, <laughs> when I say, do you want to go to the Aurora market? She's like, mom, uh, no, because you're going to be there for about an hour and a half. And I just really need to get some apples and lettuce <laughs> because she knows I'm going to get stopped. But I know full well when I go there, I'm going to have some great conversations with some residents there. And what's wonderful is that you're put in a setting where you may not necessarily discover some of the conversations that you, you know, you may have otherwise if it's through some sort of political um, hot topic. Meanwhile, this is a very organic conversation and it could foster some great creativity. And I think it's a very important setting to put yourself in because you could learn something in those situations you never thought you could learn before. Uh, I appreciate the candor on the question. I, I, I feel for your daughter because I've been in that position before as well. So I know that sometimes the trip to the market is only supposed to be five minutes, but usually lasts about an hour and a half. I, I want to turn to the second segment now, and I want to talk about the town of Aurora as a whole. And before I ask the first question, I'm going to preface it by saying this is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a policy of council. This is not a direction of council. This is the councillor's opinion. I don't know why, but we get e emails about this question all the time. But here we are. So, councillor, in your opinion, as of recording this episode, what do you believe are the biggest issues or issue facing the town of Aurora today? Yeah, yeah, that's a really uh, tough one. Um, I do find a lot of the context of what's uh, what's a lot a lot of pressure, say, on the community is the housing. And I know that is a federal, provincial, but yet it is now a municipal responsibility. And, uh, you know, we just recently had a housing pledge that we had passed, um, committing to building additional affordable and attainable units. And this is something that's going to be uh, an eight year process that municipalities have been asked to commit to. And right now, when I'm knocking on doors, even, you know, non election related, because that's what I do throughout my term, uh, that is really the number one. Um, issue that people are looking for is attainable or affordable housing for uh, their their own kids when they're growing up. I would say that <clears throat> the second most um, alarming issue for people in the community in general, and I guess this is across, I would say across Canada, is mental health. So uh, I don't know if I had mentioned before, but during the pandemic when I could, I actually created a a door knocker with a QR code and knocked when it was appropriate. And if they weren't home, I just left it. And I had some very um, high level questions that were municipally related, but also federal and provincial. And the top two were financial stability and uh, mental health. So through those, um, through that data that I collected, I did do some policy changes to help address some of those issues. Um, however, there's a much bigger um, picture that we need to work on in order to advance that. If I were to say the second thing more on the ground, I would say the municipal infrastructure in the sense that in order to achieve 
all this housing, we need sufficient allocation. We need uh, services. We need community centers. Um, and on top of that, we need to be able to maintain our, our capital assets, like our stormwater management. So Aurora's been around a long time, and we've got some old infrastructure down there that uh, we need to start uh, repairing and replacing. And we do have a 10-year capital plan in place, but sometimes these things um, need repair sooner than later. So there are a lot of pressures. So I want to dissect a few of these issues that you just talked about here as you, as the role of counselor, but also as the town. And I want to start on the housing uh, file, because this is not an issue that you're the first one who's come brought this to my attention. It seems to be an uh, issue across Canada. Um, I understand that the town of Aurora just signed their pledge from the uh, federal or the provincial government, the Ford government about uh, making additional housing. Um, this is, this is needed. We do need housing. We do need affordable housing, but we don't have the workers to build these houses. We don't have builders to build these houses. How does Aurora attract builders to come build uh, housing, affordable housing in your community while you're trying to battle against different communities who are under the same pressures as well? Do you guys have a plan in place? Or are you guys looking at working with other municipal organizations to try to build things together to achieve these goals that the federal and provincial governments are laying out to ask municipalities to build houses, housing quicker? Thank you for the questions. There was a lot to unpack there. <laughs> um, <laughs> there was a lot of, to unpack with your answer, so I have to give you a lot of things to unpack as well. <laughs> That's okay. I appreciate that. Uh, first, I'll start by saying that within our pledge currently at 8,000 units that we already have over 8,000 in the pipeline. So that's at various stages from a review to um, a preliminary consultation to approve projects and to permit. So that's a myriad of different things. So I do think that that is achievable. And we, we do have areas that would be appropriate for intensification. I think the bigger challenge is understanding um, or having a guiding document that would determine where that type of intensification would occur. And I know that is something that we are working on and staff is putting together as a subset of our official plan um, for this, this type of housing. So when I say this type of housing, I would suggest mid-rise buildings that includes condos and purposeful rentals. I think the biggest challenge that we have is, you know, the community is so used to five, six stories. We've always been the land of, you know, nice big, big backyards. And, um, you know, going any higher than that can be a bit challenging for some. However, it's it's a delicate balance. Is NIMBYism uh, and, alive and well in Aurora? I'm sorry? Is NIMBYism not in my backyard? I don't want things to change. I want things to stay the same the way they are because that's what drew me to Aurora. That's what brought me to Aurora. And how do you balance the need to grow, to build these houses for people to come and uh, potentially have own their first house with the people who say, I, 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 love, I, I want that, but just do it in another community, not in Aurora. Go do it in Markham or do it in Newmarket. Like leave Aurora the way it is. Yes, I think NIMBYism is alive and well in all communities. In fact, I you think don't that... say, counselor. <laughs> in fact, some would say it's bananas, which is uh, build absolutely nothing up anywhere near anybody. So it is a delicate balance. And uh, like I said, we have this uh, report that is coming. And I said, with having this guiding document, that's going to help us identify where those areas are appropriate. Uh, right now, I know within our official plan that is in draft review has identified some increased height, which is preliminary around our major transit area, which makes sense where you're going to have your, your go station and so forth. And developers have taken an interest to those locations. And it's a matter of just getting the, the shovels into the ground. Um, I would suggest that some projects may not be going forward as quickly, not because there's lack of people available to work to do them. It's the cost of the high inflation uh, and the uh, the interest rates to put to uh, in order to um, um, for the capital cost of the project itself. I think where we as municipalities need to also consider is if we're asking developers to include affordable housing or attainable housing for a lack of better term, we also have to consider performa plays a role and you can't 
expect a five-story building and call it attainable housing. Because in order for a builder to get the, the cost back for that building, it's no longer attainable for those units. So you do need to um, have that delicate balance with intensification, which in some cases I would say means more height, what that height looks like in order to um, facilitate an amicable situation between the official plan and what we're challenging with the official plan and the surrounding areas, that is probably our greatest challenge. And we're trying to work through that and creating some step process um, different ways of design, um, taking consideration your shadowing and also your location. People don't want to lose that sense of community and become an alley of high rises. And I don't think that's what Aurora wants either. But uh, I, I would suggest that 2022 election, that 80% of the people that I knocked on doors all had something to say about having more attainable or affordable housing. So if that's the case, we need to step up to the plate and we need to compromise and find that delicate balance. Is Aurora growing? How fast is Aurora growing right now? Like, are you on pace to keep up with the growth that you currently have, whether it be through infrastructure, service levels, or even housing? Or are you guys in this sort of weird spot right now, like a lot of municipalities where you're at a standstill because of what happened during the uh, pandemic and it kind of slowed everything to a halt and you're seeing that growth now happen a few years after is it growing the town? Yeah, I think I think Aurora is still growing. Uh, sure, there has been some pause just due the to the to to, to the pandemic. Um, however, you know, construction is alive and well. Um, I would suggest that there are some projects that might have been on hold due to the high inflation rate and the interest cost, but they're approved projects. Um, other than that, we have the infrastructure to accommodate this housing target with the exception of allocation, which is a bit of a concern. But from what I've been told at our last meeting we had around council from our head of council had suggested that the region, which is York region, because we're a, um, a two tier um, municipality. Um, As of right now, we'll see what yeah. happens in the future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll see what happens. <laughs> um, I was told there was gonna be some sort of announcement in November to let us know how much more allocation we would get. But I think it's achievable. I really do think it's achievable so long as the incentives are in place. I think this is a three-prong approach between the federal government, the provincial government, and the municipalities. The municipalities can't be the ones obviously giving all the incentives. Um, on the provincial level and the federal level, we're talking you know, development charges and red tape and bureaucracy and obviously some monetary incentives in order to help make it happen. In our... 25 minute actual conversation, but 40 minutes of us uh, chatting beforehand as well. I, I get the sense that mental health is a, a big passion for you, making sure people get the accurate uh, uh, services that they need because you went out and you door knocked and you put flyers on and you you've mentioned it a few times in our interview so far. While mental health and addictions is traditionally a provincial issue, municipalities are kind of bearing the brunt of this because th the issues are happening in your communities. What is the town of Aurora doing while you wait for the provincial government to address these issues as well to sort of offset the challenges that people are dealing with around their mental health and addiction challenges that they're facing? Thank you so much for the question. Uh, well, first off, I'll say within that data that I collected, yes, mental health was a very uh, high uh, point of concern for people and not just for adults, but also, also youth. That was a, a major thing, uh, as well as seniors. And so what, what I had found is that when people were feeling high anxiety, that they didn't know where to turn or how to look for the right help. And I thought the least that I would be able to do and provide as a counselor is those resources to make it easier for someone to get that help because they felt like they were, they, they just didn't know what to do. They were helpless for a lack of better term and, and didn't know who to call. You go on that web and you look around and it's very, very overwhelming. And then you start thinking like, what's this going to cost? And am I going on a waiting list and who's going to know about things? And so it was very important to me to, to be able to offer resources that were not for profit or where the costs were very low, but yet something that was very easy and attainable. So what I decided to do was work with staff and create 
um, a landing page that was very easily accessible from the front page of our town website and have subcategories that were specific to age groups. And so I thought that was very helpful. I got a lot of great feedback. They were very excited. I had some not-for-profit contact in me. I was reaching out to as many people as I could locally within Aurora, but also in the region for support. But also I put in provincial and federal supports. And so when I say subcategories, I would even include um, young adults. There was a lot of young adults that were in their 20s, early 20s, that didn't seem to fall in the same categories as some older adults as well as um, diversity of people. So the LGBTQ community um, as well. And I think by separating it, it made it a lot easier. Seniors as well, sometimes they didn't, uh, you know, they don't know that, oh, there's a service to where I could have a phone conversation with somebody for free. And that, you know, because a lot of them were lonely during the pandemic. So now that that information was there and easy to find. So as a municipality, I thought it was our due diligence to be able to at least be able to have these resources to give the community immediately so they had somewhere to look, knew who they could call and have those resources available. Because as a counselor, you are on the ground listening to the people who are having these issues and anxiety. And now I'm armed with this information to share. And I thought it was important that other counselors would also be armed with this information to share. Uh, in addition to that, you know, I did take it upon myself to visit some of the local uh, mental health services that are in and around Aurora and ask questions and the services they had. And I, I took it upon myself to make sure that I could, you know, um, yell at the rooftops, you know, the kinds of services that they offered to ensure that that information was there. So really public awareness and resources. I appreciate that. Uh, I want to just sort of ask one last question before we move on here into my last segment, because I'm cautious of time. Um, I, I, I want to ask about sort of the issues of your community, but on from a different angle here. Now, you mentioned three issues that you believe that are important to your community that your community is facing. But hypothetically, if I was in Aurora, say, August of this year, and I was downtown walking the streets of Aurora in front of your town hall, and people were coming up to me saying, hey, you're from Alberta, which I did. And people were. And I asked them what they thought were the big issues of their community. Now, these some of those issues that you've mentioned, affordability, infrastructure, mental health, were some of the answers. But I also heard other things. Playgrounds. I heard potholes. I heard this, that, and the other. I heard more micro issues. How do you, as a counselor and as counsel, balance the, the issues that your community is facing while not forgetting about the issues that the people are, are talking about? Because people may say, I have a pothole and it's the biggest pothole and it's the most obtrusive pothole in my neighborhood and I need it fixed. But you look at it and say, we'd love to go fix that. We'd love to fix the road. But unfortunately, this street over here has a bigger pothole. We need to address that first. How do you balance the issues of your community with the issues of the individuals who are in your community? Yeah. So you know. <laughs> another another loaded question, not... Rachel. <laughs> I'm hoping I'm not leaving any potholes open, but uh, this is where I would say that this is when we really lean on staff and we really do, you know, we do have an excellent 10 year capital plan and we really do rely on the information that is given us so we can communicate that to the resident. Now, that now that's not to say that, you know, we could discover that maybe we um, were misguided in what we had estimated longevity, whether it be a park or a pothole, and we will go make those assessments. But it's really just trying to um, communicate to the residents um, that we do have a plan in place and that we will address it in the most appropriate and most fiscal responsible way possible. I appreciate that. I want to turn to my last segment here. And before I do this, I, as I just sort of jokingly said, I was in Aurora this summer. I want to get back to Aurora because I feel like I've just scratched the surface on what Aurora is all about. Now, I believe that tourism is a big aspect that municipalities kind of have to pick up and sort of promote themselves with. I believe as Canadians, we should be visiting our backyards, visiting these great communities that we have. Uh, I, As I said, I feel like I just scratched the surface while I was in Aurora. When I come back next summer, I will make sure I reach out to you and talk to you and see if we can grab a coffee. But as I have listeners across Canada and around the world, if they're coming through Aurora, 
what are some of the hidden gems from a tourism aspect that they need to stop in and see? And what would you recommend people do while they're in Aurora? Yeah, I mean, this is a topic that I I could just chime off a whole bunch of things. And depending on, <laughs> depending on the, the time of year, obviously, uh, I, I do want to start off with something that's not 100% open. Um, we have invested nearly $6 million in a project called Town Square, which is located downtown. And it is a, an extension of our beautiful um, Church Street School known as the Aurora Cultural Center. And it's at attached to the Aurora Public Library. And we've made several upgrades um, to that facility with programming space, but also a big performance hall and an outdoor skating rink. Uh, this is going to be a fabulous, fabulous community hub for people to come together for events, entertainment. You could have a wedding, Christmas market. It, it, honestly, it's endless, 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 endless opportunities and, and definitely also increasing the arts and culture in our town. And one fun fact that I had um, learned from our department is that Aurora's has arguably the longest art show of 60 years in Canada. Yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah. Just so when is that? Crazy. Because I'm coming back next summer for that then or next spring <laughs> or whatever it is. Yeah. So it's in partnership with Soira. So um, York Region Arts and um, Society for York Region Arts. And it's usually held in May and it's uh, a two or three day event. Right now it's all three floors of town hall, but I'll probably move over to the new town square and um i can't remember how many um pieces of artwork but in the art world it is considered um, a huge huge quantity more than 200 artists participating with more than 340 original pieces which is massive wow massive. so we really do pride ourselves in the arts and culture in aurora um, one of the other things that you could look look to for something that's very interesting is that we actually have a national historic site in our town called the Hillary House. And the Hillary House is uh, one of the most um, original um, Gothic revival style homes in Canada that's um, still up and erect. So that's something that you can go in and tour and see what it looks like in all its original glory. Okay, you, you've just sold me on not only coming back, but staying like a week because A, I love anything that has national historical site designation. So yeah. I will be there for sure. Um, but what about yourself? Where do you go after a long day of work, after a long day of council meetings to just decompress and let it all go away? Is there any place in the town of Aurora that you can just go and escape and just recenter yourself knowing that you're going to have to get back at it again tomorrow? Yeah, there's plenty of green space in Aurora. That's what we pride ourselves on. We have a wonderful arboretum with uh, very unique plants and different tree species. I think also within that site in Lambert Wilson Park, which is attached to it, has one of the oldest trees. And I don't know if it's a, uh, York region. I'd have to like double check my facts, but it's a rather old oak tree of sorts. Um, and it's just a really great place that you can go for a walk and ponder. Uh, we also have Old Town Park, which is a beautiful setting right in the center of um, Aurora, it's a neighborhood that I live in. And uh, I, I love it. And every Saturday morning we have a market there and it's just a great place to go walk and check out the vendors and the local people and just kind of decom to me that's decompressing for my day <laughs> and that's what i would suggest so i want to end on the million dollar question and it's the kind of question that i think every municipal politician knows how to answer but i always like asking it anyway what makes the town of aurora such a unique place to live to work and to raise a family counselor yeah you know um in 2018 when i knocked doors Fundamentally, uh, when I would tell people one of the number one reasons why I wanted to run is because I wanted to um, protect what made Aurora a beautiful place. And whenever I would talk about, you know, grabbing that cup of sugar, boring an egg, and just that feeling and knowing that we've all done it, I always, always got a smile from that person at the door because they could all resonate because, yeah, we're like, yeah, like that's why we're here. Um, building a community of a community. 
And what I loved the most was living on my streets and raising my kids is that everybody knew where your kids were. Um, they, everybody raised the family together, the community together. And I still believe that that is the way of people in Aurora. And I think you yourself said you came to Aurora and you actually had people stop and ask you questions generally and why you're here because we're a very engaged community. Um, we, we feel like we are the gem above the city of Toronto, best kept secret, as I have always said. Um, Aurora is just very great. I, I think that, I think truly it's a special place and uh, I want to keep it that way. You, you, you kind of took away my last statement, but I, I want to ask when I was there, as you just mentioned, I did get uh, stopped and asked a few questions from people. What makes Aurora residents so friendly? Because I, I felt like people were just talking to me like I was, I, I knew them for about 20 years. Like they didn't know me from Adam and yet they, they were honestly open and just wanting to ask questions. And it's so rare to find that in 2023 where people are so engaged, but also so, uh, passionate about their community because I asked them what are some of the hot spots and they told me oh you should go to this uh, coffee shop or you should go down do this uh, if you have a few hours I'm like I wish I could but I have to he head out as well what makes why why are so why are people so friendly in your community I've got to ask the question <laughs> there's something in the water I guess I don't know <laughs> <laughs> something in the, and I can hey fun fact I can tell you too that we're also uh home of very several several nhl players live in aurora but i'll leave that as a mystery Ooh, now I'll i need leave. to go back and start knocking on doors pretending i'm a politician <laughs> counselor right. thank you so much for sitting down and doing this um i honestly say this a lot but i think it needs to be said often and more often to our local leaders thank you for stepping up Thank you for stepping up and serving your community. After 45 minutes of this interview, I can tell you that I, I have a better understanding of what Aurora is all about, but I, I have a better understanding that the people who are around that council table, if they're like you, are doing it for the right reason. So thank you so much for stepping up and for being part of the community, but also leading your community over the last five years. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in diving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential to our mission of the show. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support as well. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes or by visiting www.crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, Stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.